Welcome everyone to the Helm 3 Deep Dive, or as I like to say, it's more than just Tiller being gone. So, um, well, yes, thank you, thank you. I know, pitiful jokes all around, but um, I welcome better. everyone here. We have a couple of the hecklers, I mean maintainers of Helm here as well, and uh, I would like to remind the hecklers that heckling an Irishman in a public forum is like sticking your arm down a bear's mouth, so don't do it. Um, so first off, I am Taylor Thomas. I'm one of the Helm core maintainers. Um, I've done AKS work at Microsoft. I'm currently doing a lot of Helm work uh, as part of my day job at Microsoft. Um, there's all my social information up there if you want to find me on Twitter, or GitHub, or in the Kubernetes Slack. Hi, my name is Martin Hickey. I'm also a core maintainer in Helm, and I'm a developer at IBM. And as I said, uh, my social uh, details are all up there. So. So onward to our agenda. So what we're gonna be covering today is just a few announcements about the project itself. Uh, then we'll be going into the new functionality that's, that's in Helm 3, some of the architectural changes we've done. Then we'll go into how you can migrate, which has been a common question we've been getting. And then a little bit about how the security model has changed from Helm 2 to Helm 3. So I'll give it over to Martin to talk through some of these announcements. So first and foremost, in case you've been hiding under a rock, you didn't hear, Helm 3 got released, yay! Come on, let's hear some love here, please. Come on. Yeah, oh, we got a crowd this it. evening, Taylor. Oh yeah, we're all very We're gonna happy. rock here. Um, okay, so just, we know what it's like near the end of the second day of uh, KubeCon. You're feeling tired, maybe you socialized too much last night, maybe you had a couple of vodka pops, who knows. Can everybody stand up here who has ever pushed a contribution to Helm? They've raised maybe a Helm issue, pushed some code, some documentation, uh, you name it. Can you please stand up? Okay, that's not bad. Can stay standing if you're standing. Sorry there, Scott. Um, can everybody stand up who has used Helm Tree already, be it pre-release or, or GA? Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. A little bit more. Can everyone stand up who has ever used Helm before? Helm 2, Helm 3, whatever. Ha! Aha! Now, now you're all standing up it. and awake. But so, really, really, truthfully, it's a thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what we'd like to say is thank you very much indeed. You uh, oh. Wait a minute. Yeah, you hit it. Oh. We'd just like to say thank you very much from everyone in the community. Thank you for everyone help, help, helping to get Helm Tree out there and give, give each other all a round of applause, please. Okay, so one final announcement. Um, in the last, I suppose, two weeks ago, um, Helm passed the security audit, and this was a third party security audit uh, sponsored by the CNCF. Um, and it's Matt Farina mentioned this at the um, keynote on the first day. Uh, Helm passed with a really, really good reference saying that it's fit for production. So that was great to hear. And this is all part of the process where we're uh, trying to graduate uh, the Helm project over the next year. So hopefully early next year it graduates as, as a project. So let's move on to the uh, more details. Okay, so around new functionality. Um, so a lot of new functionality has been brought in into Helm 3, um, and a lot of this has been around usability, uh, stability, and also making Helm more battle-hardened uh, battle for production. Now I'm not gonna go through every bit of the functionality uh, today, because there's quite a lot of it there, and we want to get through just a lot of other sections, so, what I'm going to do is cover what I have up here, um, and I look at the changes in charts, at the repos, uh, the upgrade strategy, and uh, test frameworks and OCI registry. So let's kick into the um, chart updates. So what I've put up here is um, a chart YAML file, and you can see at the very top, uh, I've highlighted uh, three things, but at the top I've highlighted the API version. So in Helm 3, we've introduced new capability into charts. And, and to help us to identify the difference between um, Helm v2 charts and Helm v3 charts, we've had to bump the API version. Uh, and it's been bumped up to v2. Now, 
I think we should apologize here because obviously there's going to be a bit of confusion here. The API version used to be V1 for Helm V1 and Helm V2, and now we bumped it up to V2, and this corresponds more to Helm V3. So, yeah, apologies if there's a bit of confusion on this, but this is, this is the way we had to do the incremental um, um, update to, uh, from V1 to V2. The second thing I've highlighted is a new, a new um, uh, property field called type. And this field can be of two values. It can either be application or library. And why we've introduced this is because of library charts have been introduced as, um, as a, a first class citizen into, um, in, in Helm 3. So your library charts are the same as common charts in V2. And we want to be able to distinguish between the both of them. And if anyone has used common charts in V2, you'll know that common charts by default normally don't have any deployment objects. And if you try to install them, they unfortunately get installed as an error. And um, it's, it's just a bit clunky, and then you have to install it back out. So we decided we'd like to be able to differentiate between them, and especially if they're being used as subcharts or subcharts within subcharts. Uh, the final thing we've done around, or one of the final things we've done around uh, charts is the dependencies. So previously, dependencies were defined in requirements, but we decided to consolidate that and move the requirements into the chart.yaml file. So that means in V3, um, uh, requirement files are no longer rendered, and uh, this is where you define your um, dependencies. And the last thing around charts is value validation. So we got a, a lot of feedback uh, from people around uh, the fact that when they're using charts, what values are to be set or not. Sometimes it's a case of maybe you haven't read the readme, but other times it's maybe the readme is out of date. So what we've done here is we've provided the, the hooks that if a particular chart has um, um, a value schema or a JSON schema field defined, then this JSON schema file, file can be used to check the values during particular commands. The commands are up there, your install, upgrade, etc. And if you want to have a JSON file in your, whether you're a chart maintainer or, um, or chart creator, uh, you need to then define the file, uh, name the file as values.schema.json and place it in the root of the chart. So around to repos. Um, so it's probably if you've used Helm before, you know that there's an official uh, chart repository and that's hosted by Helm and you can have the stable or the, the incubator uh, repos. Um, so that started out initially as, as a place where uh, users or chart maintainers could place their charts. And, and as, as, as was anticipated over time, these charts have grown, the amount of repos have grown, especially around vendors like Bitnami, et cetera, have come in. So there's a lot of repos out there now, and uh, all charts are not uh, hosted on, on the official chart repo. So a big part of the work probably running in parallel with Helm3 was to create a, a hub, and this is like a central catalog for you to search for charts. Um, so the idea here is that chart repos can put the hooks in place, and it's a, a one-stop shop for you to check where those charts are. So then when you find where the repo is, you can include your repo into the static repo uh, file in Helm, and then you can install your chart from there. Um, as part of this in Helm 3, then, we've uh, expanded the search capability so that now you can search in Helm Hub and find out where your particular charts are. Um, also, out of the box now, when you, when you take Helm and Helm 3, you will not have any repos uh, added out of the box. For example, your stable or an incubator. Because of the, the fact here that the different repos are out there, we're, we're uh, relying on you to add the repos that you need as you go along. And so that brings us to the next one, which is around our improved upgrade strategy. So in Helm 2, uh, many people who have used it a lot in production have run into this, where basically all Helm 2 was doing was comparing the most recent chart manifest with the new chart manifest you were trying to install. And so it would ignore things that were, were added after the fact. So Helm 3 changes this to use a three-way merge strategy, where it includes the, the live cluster state. Now, what that means in practice is it looks like this. So if you have a current state of a cluster, like here on the left, um, where you have this Nginx pod at 2.0, and then let's say you're using a service mesh of some kind or anything else that injects a sidecar, uh, it will inject that you inject the sidecar in, and then now you want to now you want to update your your Nginx container. So you bump it to 2.1.0, and that's your new your new manifest. What would happen in Helm 2 
is you would end up with just a containers array that with the new server and it would have gotten rid of the old sidecar. In Helm 3, because we're using the three-way merge, it actually pulls it in and keeps the sidecar or any additional data that you added out of band into the main chart. So it's a, a hopefully way more useful for people when you have that extra state that you've added in. Um, in addition to that, we also have the update to the test framework. So there's been a lot of work done um, and there's actually gonna be even more work in the future uh, versions of, of Helm 3 uh, around this. One of the major things is instead of tests having to be bare pods, you can use them as jobs now. We also got rid of the difference between a test failure and test success hook and just made it test. Um, this also came with, we added the logs flag and that allows you to stream logs back from your test pods and we removed the cleanup flag, but you can use the um, delete policy for the hooks to be able to delete those automatically. And there'll be more changes coming as we, as we go along to 3.1 and 3.2 that'll make it even easier. The nicest thing here is now you can run the test item potently. So you can run it again and again and again and you won't run into the name collision errors if you had used Helm test in the past, if that's what had happened. So the last thing, which is a, a super interesting one, is the OCI registry support. So this is an experimental feature, meaning we, know, we offer no uh, backwards compatibility guarantees here. And you can use the feature using that export Helm experimental OCI flag that we have up there. Um, but this allows you to push a chart into something like a Docker registry, anything that's OCI compliant. Now this is experimental because we're still working with the OCI uh, spec and everyone in that community to solidify exactly what this will look like, but we have the experimental support in there right now if that's something that interests you. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and go into some of the architecture changes that have happened. Okay, so as the title says, here's the big thing. No more Taylor, universe is safe again, you know, all, all is good, okay? So we'll talk more about that later with security. <laughs> So I suppose the main point here is, how, how did this all come about? So in, just to give a tiny little background to what Helm 2 had. So Helm 2 had a client server model where Tiller, the service was installed, or the server was installed in the cluster, and the Helm client communicated it using gRPC, and, uh, rend and Tiller then rendered the charts and uh, pushed them to the Kubernetes API server. Um, so uh, probably, and this is before my time, but Going back to uh, the first Helm Summit in 2018, there was quite a lot of input from the community and especially at that summit around, right, can we get rid of Tiller? Do we really need Tiller? And the community and, and the core maintainers looked at it and said, actually, maybe we don't. So a big undertaking was, uh, was brought forward in early 2018 to say, right, let's do this work. And what he brought around was a complete rewrite underneath the hood of Helm to produce Helm 3 with no longer needing Tiller and just with a client uh, architecture. Uh, so thanks to the community for pushing that in and thanks to everybody who worked on it to get it there because this was a big piece of work. So as part of this as well, we looked around where does our configuration uh, get stored? So initially it was stored probably in home.helm or whatever Helm patch you decided to use. But we kind of looked and said, we, we should have a more standard way of doing this, and we decided to support the XDG uh, base specification. And what this does is it provides you a, a, a properly defined way of where your configuration go, and it's also platform independent. So in this situation, I've just, I've just sh we've just shown here uh, Linux uh, paths, so home with .cache, .config, and .local. And you can see uh, .local slash share, and you can see that within that then you're gonna have the particular applications that support XDG, Helm in this case, but if you look in there, you'll probably find some more uh, applications that do the same. Um, as a result of this work, um, and no longer needing to install Tiller, or needing to have configuration um, there straight out of the box, we then decided that Helm init was needed any longer and it has been removed because now, uh, our configuration can be lazily created on the fly as we need be. So another big aspect of the changes to this is how we, how we store the um, uh, release objects. So in V2, we were storing them as config maps uh, inside in the cluster, and they're now going to be stored as secrets by default. And yes, you could configure it to be uh, secrets in V2 if you wanted. Another big aspect is because we no longer have a tiller, 
and everything was generally running under the namespace of Tiller, and these objects were being stored under that namespace. They're now being stored correctly under the namespace of the particular release that you want to deploy in. And what this does is, and has been asked for a while, is uniqueness around release names. So before, the release names were, well, they were probably not cluster-wide, but they were tied to the namespace of your Tiller. So if you had one Tiller instance running in the uh, cluster, then it was like it was cluster-wide for you. But what it is now is, it's now unique just to the particular namespace. So that means then, if you have different, lots of different namespaces, you have different releases, then you can, have, you can, um, you can basically repeat the names if you, if you like, to, if, you like, if you so be. Uh, another, uh, nice one. You got trigger happy there? Yeah? A little yeah. trigger happy. He's, he's <clears throat> back with me. Um, is also the release object. So when we moved um, at Tiller and we got rid of gRPC, we were then able to look at saying, right, with gRPC, there were some constraints around the particular types we could use, and so many objects we were having had to be more brought down into more vanilla types. So with uh, the removal of Tiller now, we can pass a lot of the objects around. And what it means is the release object we store in the secret in the data field of the secret object means we can store it as particular objects. So that has changed quite a lot. Uh, and also the name, um, release names now are prefixed with uh, the name I've shown there, sh.helm.release.e1. And this is uh, because of uniqueness around we found when you're trying to merge from v, uh, migrate from V1 to V, from V2 to V3, you can have issues. So why we're putting this up here is for, for a lot of people out there, if you don't go through, if you go through the basic, uh, through the standard CLI of Helm, you're okay. If you have gone in the back door and you go into cluster and you've been taking the release objects that are base64 encoded and gzipped, then be aware of this because we, this is where the big changes come around Helm with the architecture and the infrastructure changes we have. These are something you know if you go in the back door or if you're going in through the, uh, the go client code. Now the other big thing to note is, uh, as Martin said, most of the things are backwards compatible from Helm, from Helm 3 to Helm 2, so most everything will work. Um, CRDs is one of the big changes. And just to lead off with that, um, as we kind of discussed how CRDs work, we've noticed that the, the community has not fully solidified on a general practice for what you're supposed to do with managing CRDs and ordering. And there's a whole bunch of things that, that need to happen around CRDs. And so we tried to back off to the minimal thing that was needed. So basically, now we have removed the idea of a CRD install hook. There's some interesting technical things that we can talk about outside of this. Um, discussion about why that, that was removed, but now they're in the CRDs directory. So you, you place your, your CRDs there and they'll get autom it's an upsert. They'll automatically get installed, or if they exist, they'll, nothing will happen. Um, the good thing is, is that CRD install hooks are ignored just with a warning in Helm 3. So your chart can still support Helm 2 and Helm 3 simultaneously by leaving your current CRD install hooks in place and creating the new CRDs directory with the, the CRDs in there as well. So just note that those CRD changes are there. They're automatically applied for you without any other flags or changes. And if you want to skip them, there's a flag for that. Uh, just one thing on that too, and it's kind of just a little side story. I was talking to someone in DevOps in my office uh, about a week or so ago. And the pattern here about putting your, your, your CRDs in there and they've been installed from, from the onset before anything else is rendered isn't a pattern that's new. Um, from talking to the, to the DevOps team, what they often do with their CRDs is they have actually a chart for their CRD that gets installed first, and then they have a application chart afterwards. So it's not an anti-pattern, so to speak. It's, it's probably a good pattern that's being used anyway in the community. And we'll keep building on it as the community kind of standardizes on specific practices. The other good thing is we have a new Go SDK. So um, essentially, the CLI is just a wrapper around the SDK with some data massaging that makes it prettier for you to see when you, when you print it out on a CLI. Um, so you can now use the, this package a lot easier. If you ever tried to use Helm 2, it was possible, but it was kind of a, a little bit of a nightmare to spin up. Uh, things are actually a lot easier now, and these are the main packages to care about. Um, there's a whole bunch of other ones in there, but I actually wanted to show really quick an example. Now, don't worry, these slides are uploaded on the schedule, so you can go there and pull this down. But as you can see, this is not a large block of code. Um, to, this is just a simple thing that's basically listing all the, all the re, uh, releases in a single namespace. Um, and so it only requires importing two Helm packages, and then you set up your config to make sure it reads everything in properly, and then you list things out. Um, this allows people to kind of compose things in different ways. 
I've talked to probably several of you who are in this audience who came and visited us at the booth about um, complex deployment patterns. This enables you to do that by allowing you to kind of pull out the functionality you need and insert other steps that you have in between the things that Helm does. So it's available now as a, a much more clean uh, Go SDK. And it's subject to the same backwards compatibility uh, guarantees that we say with our Helm CLI. So exported APIs will not change on you. And just an example of the community eating its own dog food is basically the two to three plugin when it's um, when it tries to st when it stores the um, the map to, and we'll talk about it in a minute and we're just coming on to it actually is that when it's storing the release objects in V3 it is going through the um, the uh, the Go uh, SDK. So on to migrations. Okay, first and foremost. You, and this is a question that has come up at the booth the last few days and out in the community as well. You should still be able to run your Helm charts, render them, deploy them, et cetera, using Helm tree, okay? Um, with a little bit of a caveat. Um, so you no longer, uh, Helm will no longer create uh, namespaces on the fly. So what we mean by that is, if you want to deploy into a particular namespace, you need to create the namespace beforehand. Um, and the reason behind that is we wanted to follow more the pattern of uh, kubectl and the Kubernetes ecosystem. Now, I know there's a lot of discussion out there at the moment. Please join the discussion. And uh, there's some great, some great points being brought in. And if you, you really miss it, I wrote a plugin. It's really stupid simple. You can just go download it and install it, and it'll create the namespace for you just like you had it before. So if you really want it, it's there as a plugin. Uh, CRDs. Uh, we just mentioned earlier. So the CRD hooks are gone. So if you want to use CRDs in Helm tree, you'll need to put the uh, basic manifest file, not, not a template in, a manifest version of the files into the CRD directory in root. OK, so oh, we boomed. We jumped, did we? No, I didn't. Uh, can't get good help anymore. OK, so um, <laughs> uh, what we know come around is so we, we've talked in the architectural changes, and the changes we've made, when you make changes like this, you change the architectural module from client server to client. Uh, you change how your release objects are stored underneath the hood, et cetera. You expect there's going to be differences between uh, Helm 2 and Helm 3, OK? So to help with this is we, we need to look at migrating. So how do you migrate uh, a cluster that's managed by V2 or uh, Helm V2 and by Helm 3? So let's not worry. There's no, there's no need to run out of our own um, uh, thinking everything's on fire. Uh, yes, we have a plan for migrations. So there's particular two use cases where we've, we've looked at. The first one is the strangler pattern, and the other is in situ. Uh, what I mean by the strangler pattern, if you haven't heard of it before, is the idea here that you manage the migrations yourself. And what I mean by that is you install your Helm 2 and Helm 3. They can coexist in the same cluster. The one thing to watch out for, the Helm binaries are named the same. So either rename one or both of the binaries or put them in different directories so you don't walk over each other. Um, <clears throat> so in this situation, Helm tree is used for any new deployments that are going to happen, new installs, et cetera. And then Helm 2's uh, deployed releases are maintained until eventually over a period of time, you might start phasing out or squeezing out those particular uh, uh, V2 uh, releases. And that should eventually come to a point where there are no more V2 releases, and it's just Helm 3, and then you remove Helm 2 from uh, the particular system and, and the cluster. Uh, the other one is in situ, or probably, I suppose, like live migrations. The idea here in this situation is that you want Helm 3 to manage the uh, particular V2 releases that have been deployed. Um, so how do you do that? So as I talked earlier, there's quite a few changes around it. Um, uh, with to do how the lease objects are stored, um, with where the configuration is, et cetera, and that the release objects aren't the same anymore. So to help you with that, we um, developed a plugin, uh, and it's inside in Helm org, and it's called Helm-223. You see it up there, or the Helm-23 plugin. Um, uh, yeah, OK? I think that's all I want to say on that. So here's just an example of it. Um, you can see here that, uh, now I've used Helm tree just to distinguish between, uh, so it'd be normally Helm anyway. But you can see here, it's a plugin as I've shown. There's uh, three commands on it. One of them is for the configuration called move config. 
So this takes uh, the existing hand configuration, and this configuration can be things like your plugins you've installed, uh, like, et cetera, and they move them over to uh, the Helm 3 locations or create the locations as they need be as well. The next one then is the converting of your releases. So these are the releases you have, have deployed, like my PostgreSQL or my SQL, et cetera. And you call, him, uh, you call it with the convert command and the name of your particular release. And then it will take all that release history. So however many releases that, uh, versions that you have or release visions you have, it will propagate through them and move them over into Helm 3. It does not touch the Kubernetes objects that have been deployed. All it's doing is taking that release information from the cluster and moving it into the format and location for Helm 3 to, to see. Now, we call this live because in this situation, your Helm 2 can still see the releases. And if you do a Helm LS with Helm 2, you'll see them. And if you do your Helm 3 LS, you'll see them, OK? Uh, the point here is when you're doing this and you start migrating over, you want to finish that migration because if you start deploying again with Helm, Helm 2 or you start upgrading some of those releases, you're going to get into an indeterminate state. No, it's OK if this happens because if you haven't removed the data for Helm 2 yet, you can still go into directly into the cluster and remove any of the Helm 3 data by searching for secrets with an owner of Helm. Okay, uh, with, with a label, owner equal to helm, helm in uh, all, all lowercase. So things are not lost there. But the idea here is that you use the plugin, move over your particular um, uh, releases, make sure your releases look okay, make sure they're working okay, and then basically the final command is clean up, which will go in, uh, it will remove all the configuration for helm 2, it will propagate through all the helm 2 releases and just remove that release information from the cluster, it will not talk touch Kubernetes objects, and then basically we'll remove Tiller. And if you try to do Helm LS then for Helm 2, it'll come back with that beautiful command that people always found Helm, uh, Helm cannot find Tiller, or else no connection, but cannot find Tiller to come back. Okay. So that brings us to the last point here, which is around the new security model. This is gonna just be a brief overview. Um, you'll see in the lower right-hand corner, and if you download the slides, there's a link to the um, talk this is taken from by Matt Fisher, another one of the core maintainers that goes into the Helm 3 security model and all its, I mean, Helm 3 versus Helm 2 security model and all its gory detail. Um, but this is just the quick review of it. So in Helm 2, the security for Kubernetes was what we'd expect it to be. But in Helm, we had things like the Tiller certificate management and the RBAC for the, for the service account running Tiller. And then when we remove Tiller, Helm 3's security model now just basically removes those. And the only thing that Helm is responsible for is the chart security. Um, basically checking the ch if, a, if a chart is signed that it's actually signed properly. Um, it's also good to note that those who are maintaining charts, it's good to make sure that your chart is up to date and secure. Um, Sneak, which is a company that's here, uh, actually just recently released a, an audit of most of the charts in the stable repository and identified some common um, flaws that people can, can easily address to um, avoid security problems. So that's something that still you have to worry about as a chart maintainer. But in Helm, basically the security model has switched to um, something basically now that it's a per user basis, or in other words, it's delegated to the uh, Kubernetes user per user security. So if, you, if I'm a user accessing Helm, it's going to have the same permissions as if I was doing it with kube control. So you can have whatever RBAC rules set up and Helm will, will listen to those same rules. So it's based off, essentially it's based off your kube config. So this is something actually that's coming up in the community where people, they now do an install and they deploy out their app in the MySQL and they give it a, a particular uh, namespace. And suddenly so they come back and they go, Helm tree seemed to deploy, it's no longer there, I went Helm LS, there's no sign of it, okay? So to bear in mind now is, when you're doing a command now with Helm, you need to sta state the namespace because what it's going to use is going to use the default namespace in kube config. If you deployed your release in a different namespace, for example, test or something like that, unless you go specify that namespace for an LS to see what has been deployed onto that namespace, or you do a dot, that all that namespace, dash dash all that namespace, you're not going to see it. So don't worry if you, if you can't see it. You just need to make sure that you need to look in the namespaces. And same if you're going in the back door and looking at the secrets, you need to look across the namespaces. So just bear that in mind that it's following that pattern. So just a quick recap here. You want to take this away, Martin? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so I was actually, yeah, we were going to say, look, we, we've, we've run through all this stuff today, okay? I'm going to talk to this. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah, he's okay. But I was talking to someone yesterday, uh, a lovely person called Mary, and she was asking us about Helm and, and, and doing, uh, basically, doing an interview around it, around, uh, for a piece around Helm. And she, she asked a really nice question about what would be the takeaways? What would be the three takeaways? And I kind of had to think about it at the time. But I suppose the first one is uh, the obvious one, which is tiller. No more tiller. So, as I said earlier, there is, do you know what I mean? This is a mind shift uh, change for a lot of people that have been using Helm 2. If you haven't, you come in as Helm 3, you're okay. But if you've been using Helm 2, you need to move away from, there is no more tiller, which was something that probably kept you awake every night. Uh, it was the thing that you threw darts at, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but it's gone now, and that basically everything's, you, as I mentioned a minute ago, is done around cube config and the particular name spaces. And to just realize that, when you're deploying and when you're looking for the details afterwards. The second one be is we have a migration path. And that's going to be very important for people. Uh, yes, some people might like to do the migration themselves, as I mentioned earlier, using a Strangler pattern, but we have the plugin there. So please go and use that, give us feedback, et cetera. You know, tell us, tell us how it is going. But that there are ways around the two, uh, as long as you don't deploy all of it, but just realize there are always um, uh, risk with, with migrations. And the final one, I think, is that a lot of people asked about, the, and you mentioned earlier, that to be able to be programmatical uh, about our SDK. Look, you know, in Helm 2, there wasn't a clear division, really, between the CLI and the package, really. You know, it was a little bit cloudy in there. Uh, you had to go in there, and you had to make it work. So a lot of great work has been done around that, too. Separate it out, make it a, a proper standalone package, Make the CLI that if you want to go in and see what the pattern, how to use the package, yes, go into slash CLI, you get that in there, and then slash package then has your details on that. So I think for me, that's the three takeaways. Um, and before I hand over about what's next to, to, to Taylor, I'd also say to people, okay, um, docs, 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 all right? Now, I've never been the greatest advocate of a docs in my all my life. I've been a developer. I always was probably please write the docs at the end, and I'm kind of putting something together. But look, we've put a lot into the docs, and why I'm saying docs to people is, definitely over the last two weeks out in the community, a lot of questions have come in around stuff that have been, you know, what I mentioned earlier about, I cannot find my, my deployment anymore, I would tell them less, uh, different stuff like that. We've put a lot of effort into the docs, the V3 docs or the main docs, you land on the page, you'll see a link above if you want to get to the old V2 docs, or you can go v2.helm.sh slash docs. Uh, go and have a look, please, because a lot of great work has been done on it. Um, there's a nice little introduction section which shows you the quick start and all that, and the other one thing that I didn't think about was, see, everyone still thinks you have to go helm in it. Um, if you go into that intro section and start, you'll see that. We're not giving out that you're not reading the docs, but go in and look at it and see how can we improve this for the next person that's coming in or whatever. So with that, I'll hand over to, to Taylor. Yeah, the common question we get is what ne what's next? To be honest, we don't have a specific roadmap for some of these things. The main thing we want to get back to is accepting new feature ads. Um, because we've been locked down for this beta phase and not really accepting new feature ads, we're, we want to get back to that. So as we come out of this holiday season, we're going to be going straight into that. And as we follow what's going on between with Kubernetes API stabling and what we're do, stabilizing and what we're doing, um, we're going to be able to see where we want to take Helm um, for its next step. But the first thing is just going to be getting those new features out. So we just have a little bit of time left. These are these are helpful links. They'll be there in the slides you can download, and we'll just leave a little bit of time here for questions. If anyone has them, there's mics at the front. Is there a microphone? Yeah, right here, up at the front. Oh yeah, two microphones. Come up and ask your questions, don't be. And then we'll go down and talk probably out the back, out in the back so we don't interrupt the next talk. Go ahead. Yeah, what about uh, library charts? Is, is there anything new there? Uh, there were talks before about uh, supporting Lua. Um, Lua will be a feature add if it is added in the future. Um, the, the main thing around library charts is mostly that you can now have something that's not going to render as a normal part of your chart, but you can use components from inside of your, so your actual normal char child chart. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a normal child chart that has a special meaning of, of telling Helm to not render it into an actual like manifest. It's just going, it just exists for you to be able to pull things from. So it was what you'd call a common chart in V2, 
we've just made it a first class citizen in V3 and call it library charts. Now, common charts and Lua are separate things altogether. Okay. Um, so they're not, they're not basically the same thing. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, why was the decision made to go with uh, Kubernetes secrets instead of something like a custom Helm CRD for releases? So I was actually there for that debate um, because I kind of proposed the initial one when we started our Helm 3 planning. And the main thing around not using a CRD is that it was simpler to have something with secrets because you have pluggable secret, back, secret backends and in Helm releases you often have credentials. And so with a pluggable secret backend, somebody can be encrypting their credentials or encrypting their at CD, it doesn't really matter. And so now that, gets that picks up on that encryption by default. There was no need to create a custom Helm thing because we also would have had to have two separate types of objects that would have had to keep updating references to each other. So anyway, we're gonna have to end now. But we will uh, first go off to the side and then when the next talk comes in, we'll go out to the back. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you.